Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third installment of our Project Seeks SES, Early Childhood Communities of Learning. Today, we are focusing on the topic, Shifting Perspectives. And to ground us in this session, let's take a moment for a few deep breaths while we consider the quote, if you can't change reality, change your perception of it. We're so happy to have you with us again today. And today we're going to, of course, review our key information, dive into our next book, which is Those Shoes by Maribeth Boltz, then reflect on that story and how we can utilize it in our own social emotional development, as well as in our early childhood classrooms with our students. Let's take a minute to dive into and review our community norms. These are important for making a space feel welcoming and safe. We hope that you take this strategy with you into different aspects of your life, maybe with your team meetings. You could even create some community norms in your classroom. Psychological safety is a topic we'll dive deeper into today after our story. So consider how having community norms makes you feel in a group safer to open up, safer to participate. Again, a reminder of what our community of learnings are all about and why we're here together to share and collaborate, to connect, to listen and respond to each other, to wonder and reflect together. As always, let's get ready to read our story. Before we dive in, get a notebook, a pen, a piece of paper, the notes app on your phone, so that while we read through the story, you can jot down any feelings that might come up for you, questions you might have, or any comments you want to remember for your reflections at the end. As you do that, let's take a moment to prepare ourselves to be present in this moment. Once you have your writing materials, Sit in your chair, on your sofa, on the ground, wherever you're most comfortable. Close your eyes if you're in a safe space to do so and ground yourself in this moment. Try imagining roots like a tree planting you in this space. Let's take three deep breaths where we inhale through the nose for five and out through the mouth for five. Breathe in, two, three, four. Five, breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. And breathe in. Two, three, four, five. Breathe out. Two, three, four, five. Breathe in. Four, five. Breathe out. Two, three, four, five. Now let your breathing slow or come more naturally to you as you sit in this space, in this moment. Thank you for bringing yourself to this present moment and grounding yourself with us today. We want to remind you that your opinions matter. Your comments, questions, and responses really help us to create each of these communities of learning in ways that are most beneficial for you. At the end of this video, there'll be a QR code for you to scan with your phone and instructions on how to do that at the end. It will open up a survey with a space for you to reflect on today's session. This is our way to collect attendance for our records, see how the community is learning and growing, and make updates like we are today with this um, method of surveying. You can still comment on the video itself if you'd like, and you'll please choose one question from each of the boxes on the survey to answer. There will be one about racial literacy, one about SEL, and one about your own reflections. Again, today's core message is shifting perspectives. Being able to see from each other's perspectives helps us to see that there are many ways to make sense of the world and shifting out of our own perspective and into others requires a lot of listening and humility. Just because someone's perspective is different does not mean that it is wrong. Practice being curious about what others think and why. Once you get to know other people's perspectives, you can have a better sense of how they will react to your questions, how they disagree with you, or how they try to build a relationship. 
as we read through and discuss, remember our working definition of social emotional learning. SEL is building brave and healthy relationships with ourselves and others in diverse communities. So let's read those shoes. All Jeremy wants is a pair of those shoes, the ones everyone at school seems to be wearing. And though grandma, Jeremy's grandma says they don't have room for want, just need, when his old shoes fall apart at school, he's more determined than ever to get those shoes. Even a thrift shop pair that maybe are too small. But sore feet aren't much fun, and Jeremy soon sees that the things he has, like warm boots, a loving grandma, and the chance to help a friend are worth more than the things he wants. Before we dive in, please note this book can elicit some strong memories or emotions or triggers about a traumatic experience as living in poverty. And this book can also unintentionally lead adults to talk about poverty in deficit ways. It's common to hear adults complain about parents who might buy something for their children when they think they might need money for other things. If you hear that line of thinking or if it starts to come up for you as you reflect and listen, Use it as an opportunity to ask yourself to shift the perspective and wonder why a parent might want to buy their child those shoes. Those Shoes by Mary Beth Boltz, illustrated by Noah Z. Jones. I have dreams about those shoes, black high tops, two white stripes. Have you ever seen something you really wanted as a child or as an adult? And then you saw everyone around you getting them. How did that make you feel? Grandma, I want them. There's no room for want around here, just need. Grandma says, and what you need are new boots for winter. When we think about want versus need as adults, we can really struggle with this. Consider how a child might understand this distinction when they don't have the depth of understanding of money, savings, or finances. Brandon T. comes to school in those shoes. He says he's the fastest runner now, not me. I was always the fastest runner before those shoes came along. Nate comes to school in those shoes. Antonio and I count how many times Nate goes to the bathroom. Seven times in one day, just so he can walk up and down the hall real slow. Next, Alan Jacoby and Terrence each get a pair. Think about how children start understanding identity and comparing themselves to others. Fitting in is a human need, especially in childhood. In the world of screens and social media, this can be more influential than ever. Then one day in the middle of kickball, one of my shoes comes apart. Looks like you could use a new pair, Jeremy, Mr. Alfrey, the school counselor says. He brings out a box of shoes and other stuff he has for kids who need things. He helps me find the only shoes that are my size, Velcro, like the ones my little cousin Marshall wears. They have an animal on them from a cartoon I don't think any kid has ever watched. When I come back to the classroom, Alan Jacoby takes one look at my Mr. Alfrey shoes and laughs. And so do Terrence, Brandon T., and everyone else. The only kid not laughing is Antonio Parker. At home, Grandma says, how kind of Mr. Alfrey. I nod and turn my back. I'm not going to cry about any dumb shoes. But when I'm writing my spelling words later, every word looks like the word shoes and my grip is so tight on my pencil, I think it might bust. Think about how it would feel to have so many kids looking and laughing at you for something you can't control. Maybe you experience this. It can be really tough to focus on things like school when we feel our needs are not being met. On Saturday, Grandma says, let's check out those shoes you're wanting so much. I got a little bit of money set aside. It might be enough. You never know. 
At the shoe store, Grandma turns those shoes over so she can check the price. When she sees it, she sits down heavy. Maybe they were marked, maybe they marked it down wrong, I say. Grandma shakes her head. Then I remember the thrift shops. What if there's a rich kid who outgrew his or got two pairs for Christmas and had to give one of them away? We ride the bus to the first thrift shop. Black cowboy boots, pink slippers, sandals, high heels, every kind of shoes except the ones I want. We ride the bus to the second thrift shop. Not a pair of those shoes in sight. Around the corner is the third thrift shop. I see something in the window. Black shoes with two white stripes, high tops, perfect shape, 250. Those shoes. My heart is pounding as I take off my shoes and hitch up my baggy socks. How exciting, Grandma says. What size are they? I shove my foot into the first shoe, curling my toes to get my heel in. I don't know, but I think they fit. Grandma kneels on the floor and feels for my toes at the end of the shoe. Oh, Jeremy, she says, I can't spend good money on shoes that don't fit. I pull the other shoe on and try to walk around. They're okay, I say, holding my breath and praying that my toes will fall off right then and there. But my toes don't fall off. I buy them anyway with my own money, and I squeeze them on and limp to the bus stop. How do we think these shoes are going to work out for him? At home a few days later, later, Grandma puts a new pair of snow boots in my closet and doesn't say a word about my two big feet shuffling around in my two small shoes. Sometimes shoes stretch, I say. Grandma gives me a hug. Take a peek at those toes of his. Looks like he's got some band-aids on from his feet sticking in those two small shoes. I check every day, but those shoes don't stretch. I have to wear my Mr. Alfrey's to school instead. One day during math, I glance at Antonio's shoes. One of them is taped up, and his feet look smaller than mine. After school, I head to the park to think. Antonio is there, the only kid who didn't laugh at my Mr. Alfrey shoes. We shoot baskets. A loose piece of tape on Antonio's shoe smacks the concrete every time he jumps. I think, I'm not going to do it. We leap off the swings. I'm not going to do it. We race from one end of the playground to the other. I'm not going to do it, I say. Do what, Antonio says, breathing hard. Grandma calls me for supper and invites Antonio over, too. At supper, he spies my shoes. How come you don't wear them? Antonio asks. I shrug. My hands are sweaty. I can feel him wishing those shoes were his. That night, I am awake for a long time thinking about Antonio. When morning comes, I try my shoes one last time. Before I can change my mind, my, the shoes are in my coat. Snow is beginning to fall as I run across the street to Antonio's apartment. I put the shoes in front of his door, push the doorbell, and run. At school, Antonio is smiling big in his brand new shoes. I feel happy when I look at his face and mad when I look at my Mr. Alfrey shoes. But later, when it's time for recess, something happens. Everywhere there's snow. Leave your shoes in the hall and change into your boots, the teacher announces. Leave your shoes in the hall. It's then I remember what I have in my backpack. New boots, new black boots that no kid has ever worn before. Standing in line to go to recess, Antonio leans forward and says thanks. I smile and give him a nudge. This page is a great example for little ones of how we can feel many things at one time. And can feel happy and mad at the same time. Let's race. The end. So bringing us back to our theme of shifting perspectives, when we don't know someone well, we can assume their perspective is similar to ours. This can do harm when trying to even be helpful. 
We can look for cues or their reactions to what we say and be open to their feedback. Active listening and humility is a big part of switching your perspective. It's much easier for you to understand others' perspectives if you've had similar experiences or identities as them. But when we have less in common, it can take some effort to set aside assumptions and generally be open to learning about their way of seeing the world. Take time to listen carefully, ask questions, invite them to share their stories. You could seek out books, music, history, food, other parts of a person's culture that can give you more ways of expanding your perspective. And the more you listen with genuine openness and curiosity, the more you'll see how many points of view there are to discover and consider. So we, after all that, can see that active listening and humility really takes effort to set aside those assumptions. Think about how you can expand your own perspective. I'm sure in your classrooms, you get many perspectives, many different understandings and cultures and awarenesses of things from the parents and the children that you see every day. How can you expand your own perspective to try to include those perspectives of the children in your classroom? When we think about social emotional learning in early childhood, which is something we of course talk about every time we do one of these communities of learning, Think about that concept I mentioned of feeling multiple things at once. This book may have brought up multiple feelings for you as we read through it. Consider that if we as adults had many feelings that we may be more equipped to sort out, children might also have a multitude of emotional responses to things. And they have a little bit of a lesser capacity to work through each of them and understand why they feel the way they do. Joy, sadness, uncomfortableness, anger, how can we sort that out and honor each feeling? How can we help a child sort out and honor each feeling? Small moments matter. Another big message of the book. Think about harm coming from one experience, one time being laughed at in a situation. How much harm can come from that? Or how much healing can come from a small moment of one child not laughing at you, just like Antonio didn't laugh at Jeremy. And they became friends and Jeremy ended up sharing his shoes. Small moments of kindness, one interaction, one moment of connection, that can all make such a big difference. Think about identity. This book really highlighted the currency of trends, how important that is to us as kids, how important culture, social groups, relationships, identity development are at this age. It highlights the importance of one's identity perspective as well. I used to be the fastest until those shoes came along. So we think about this in terms of physical and psychological safety. Those things are needed before learning can occur. We like to use the quote, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. And as I mentioned, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into psychological safety, which is being able to express yourself without fear of judgment or punishment. It exists when children can express themselves, their ideas, questions, concerns, make mistakes without the fear of judgment, humiliation, or punishment. In the school setting, this includes being able to ask questions or answer your questions pertaining to things in circle time, perhaps, but it can extend well beyond the academic part of school. So there's four pieces. Inclusion safety. Can you be your authentic self in your group? This satisfies a basic human need to connect and belong. All you have to do to qualify for inclusion safety is to be human and harmless. And when you have inclusion safety, you can bring your whole self with you to the classroom. When you don't, Things like superiority or a hierarchy can dominate that group. Barriers are maintained. You might be officially part of a group, but you won't feel part of the team without that inclusion safety. Some examples, giving people space to talk, 
So not immediately responding with your own story or perspectives, engage with them, validating how they feel when they express something personal. We recommend validating feelings in the early childhood classrooms often, all day, every day. Express curiosity. If someone looks, speaks, eats, or acts differently than you, show curiosity. Phrases like, can you tell me about, I noticed that, or would you teach me are all ways to express curiosity. Sincere curiosity helps people or your students feel that you're generally interested in who they are. Again, verbally acknowledge or validate, respect their boundaries. Let each person know you're aware of their boundaries and communicate that you'll respect them. There's also learner safety. So do you have the space to grow? Learning and growing in preschool or early childhood is, an, is a need that needs to be satisfied in order to flourish in a classroom. In this stage, you detach fear from mistakes. Mistakes are seen as part of the learning process. When you have learner safety in your classroom, learning is encouraged and celebrated. Learners are protected. Some examples value honesty or trying over correct answers. Don't assume competency. So what might be obvious to you might not be for someone else. Identify what was learned. So mistakes are most valuable, valuable when you can determine what was learned from them. Verbalize what new information you now have as a result of the mistake. And allow mistakes to feel safe in that space. We have contributor safety. This type of safety satisfies the basic human need to make a difference and offer meaningful contributions. Do you feel like you can offer up ideas, respond to questions? Some examples, encouraging equal participation, so allowing each child to have a turn as you go through circle time. And of course, we can't have every child have a turn every circle time. So teaching that patience as well is important. And challenger safety. Do you feel like you can be open about change? When we create challenger safety, we give protection in exchange for honesty. So this is giving your students or your teammates or your partners a voice to speak up when there's an opportunity to improve a way you do something. People can disagree productively. Some examples, we can show gratitude for the opportunity to learn and improve. Even if you feel embarrassed by a mistake, don't let that guide your reaction. We want the best for you, the best for your classroom, the best for your teammates and your partners. So we be open and honest, not guarded or defensive when bringing up mistakes or opportunities to improve. So we think about not being able to do, Jeremy not being able to do his schoolwork. We think about our identity. We think about that quote, I don't care what you know until I know you care. We think about a child's experiences. An overarching perspective of the trauma lens is important in this book. The example in this book is a pair of sneakers, but it could be something else. Maybe what they want or need is a hug, a caring adult. These are ways we can think about that psychological safety. If we think about a child's behavior in the classroom, think about these four components and if they feel like they're in a safe space and how we could create more psychological safety for our students, 
for our coworkers, for our peers. Social emotional learning in early childhood has a big piece on empathy. The more we're able to see from other points of view, the more we can identify with each other. Think about the classroom community, the want to connect and be in relationship with each other, that human need. Again, it goes back to that human need to connect and be in relationship with other people, which is a big part of psychological safety, as well as our own social emotional development. There's that pressure to fit in. Adults have the ability to think about class, their experiences not fitting in, but it's a little different for our preschoolers or our early childhood students to think in this way. We can still feel pressure about fitting in in adulthood, fitting in in our communities, at our workplace, and you can reflect on those experiences of fitting in. Some activity ideas to work on empathy Baby doll circle time, so teaching children how to take care of their baby doll. Practicing feelings faces, so identifying their own feeling face in the mirror, and then identifying other friends' feeling faces. Or using a we wish you well or we miss you board for absent students and thinking about friends who aren't there and sending them good wishes. Social emotional learning of identity development. To understand and respect others, we must understand and respect ourselves. In this early years, in these early years, children are just beginning to develop that sense of identity of their own and to recognize that they're individuals separate from others. You might notice this as children shift from referring themselves in the third person to the use of the pronoun I. It's vital that educators nurture this emerging sense of self-identity. It's also important to think about their sense of belonging in the group. And by creating that welcoming environment that respects diversity, celebrates differences, you can help the child develop self-confidence, self-esteem, a sense of belonging, a positive social identity, and interpersonal skills all in once. When we think about identity, we think about social currency. So that quote from the book, I used to be the fastest until those shoes came along the self first, the group. But again, creating that warming environment and welcoming environment, they can develop both their self-confidence and esteem and feel belong, like they belong. We can nurture a child's development of their individual and group identities. We can help them become aware of their own strengths, talents, and needs. We can help children know how to ask for help when they need it. Some activity ideas, describing a special or unique thing about yourself, draw yourself with your classroom family, do a family tree activity they can send, you can send home for the family to complete together, and do a show and tell where students can bring something that they love and tell why they love it. Think about why it might be important for a child to develop a positive sense of self and social identity early in life. A child learns to recognize themselves as a unique and special individual, and they understand and respect that others require that same understanding and respect. We can recognize and celebrate differences or diversity in a group, and we can continue to help them develop that positive sense of self Again, by creating that warm, welcoming, nurturing environment, emphasizing special qualities of individual children throughout the day. We can acknowledge accomplishments and progress. We can find opportunities for positive feedback, celebrate different family traditions, cultures, languages, conversations and activities. We can teach children strategies about helping others. We can have children work together to perform routine tasks, like who can help Maria put the blocks away? We can ask for volunteers to help you in the classroom. And we use those everyday activities and routines 
again, to develop a child's self and group identity. Both are so important to start developing even in early childhood. Think about how you nurture self-identity versus group identity in your classroom. There's also family and cultural dynamics. Now, we all have different values. A want versus a need. Think about who gets determined to determine that for each family. Each family is going to be different in what they want versus what they need. Every family, every person is different. Think about today's topic of shifting our perspectives. We want to be understanding of different values, wants, needs, and to be an example of kindness, openness, and understanding to the children in our classroom. As a parent or a caregiver, there is that pressure to provide what the kids want. We see so much influence from our screens, social media, the cultures that we live in, the communities that we live in. Pressures come from other parents and relatives too. In conversation with teachers, think about judgments of parents who buy fancy shoes or clothes for their kids. You might have feelings coming up or thoughts like they don't have cereal, but they buy these shoes. Try to take a step back and honor a parent's decision on their own family value system. It's not anyone else's place to determine a want versus a need. And remembering that we all have different values is the route to perspective taking and understanding that others have different values. Think about how this looks in a preschool classroom. Are children talking about the things they have, what they want, what they wear? Think about family dynamics. Are they living with multiple family members? Who gets read in what way? They can't pick up the phone or help their kids with their homework but they can spend money on shoes. Try to, again, step back from those thoughts. Step away from those immediate reactions or responses to situations like this and thinking of families in deficit ways, but trying to switch your perspective and understanding as a parent, as a teacher, as an adult, that values are different. In this story, we think about who is carrying the burden of the social emotional work in this story. We've talked about this in previous community of learning videos. And again, in this story, that work is put on the child. The child shows the advanced SEL skills in this story. Think about the skills and the development needed to make that choice. Try to switch our perspective from, wow, look at this child with such great SEL skills, to why is this child carrying the burden? What would it look like to be the adult and model that role and do it well instead of the child? As we move into some logistics, I wanna take a moment here to pause so that you can look through your reflection notes or think through all those thoughts, feelings, reactions that came up for you in your head as we read through those stories and discussed different ways to use this book in the classroom. It can be really difficult to shift our perspectives, especially if those thoughts and that deficit sense came up for us. So let's sit with that for a moment. Reflect on a time that maybe you felt pressured to be a certain way, to act or look a certain way, or a time when you felt like your needs and wants weren't being understood by someone else that's important to you. 
How can we give that same grace that we wanted for ourselves to others that we work with or that we interact with on the daily? Let's take a deep breath together. Thank you for going through that reflection and that learning with me today. Now let's talk about what's next. We would love to have you come chat with us, enjoy some refreshments and snacks while we discuss the books we've read together so far at the Homewood Community Engagement Center on Tuesday, February 27th at 3 p.m. The address is there, 622 North Homewood Avenue. We can talk about questions that might have come up, concerns, reflections you've had on the books that we've read so far, and chat about how we might or you might be using those books in your classroom already. Our future communities of learning. In March, there'll be a social emotional learning day event. We'll follow up with more information on that. April will be another video. And in May, there'll be the wrap-up event. Again, more information on that in the future. Now is the time to take out your phone, scan the QR code with your camera, and click on the link that pops up to answer some reflection questions. Again, next step, you'll answer the survey from that QR code. Please join us again at the coffee chat at the Homewood CEC. Not only will we have that great conversation, snacks, refreshments, but you'll also receive your free copies of the books that we're talking about in our communities of learning if you haven't picked them up already or received them from a healthy child consultant. We'll have those available for you to take with you. And attending that SEL Day event, which we'll follow up with more of those details at a later time. And thank you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, reflections, you can email us at healthychild.pit.edu at any time. We would love to hear your reflections, your thoughts, your feedback on how the communities of learning are going. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again soon.